It is Wednesday, July 6th. Welcome to this week's edition of CT Pulse on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski with my co-host Josh Fisher. Hey, Kate. All right, Josh, we have a lot to talk about today, including the mileage tax pilot program that's been talked about a lot in the last few days. We also have uh, some new laws that came into effect July 1st that we're going to talk about, as well as a new Fairfield official accused of sending a racist tweet. All that and a lot more coming up later mm -hmm. in the show. I also know we have Talking Transportation today. Yeah, Jim Cameron lets us know about how Big Brother is keeping an eye on you on the road. And Doug Smith, our editorial cartoonist, will stop by to sh give us a preview of the cartoons that will be in the papers this week. All right. But first, we have a guest by phone, Josh. Yeah, we'd like to welcome back to CT Pulse, this time by phone, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Bob Duff, who uh, represents Darien and Norwalk in the uh, State Senate. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Good, good. 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 Thanks for taking some time out on a, a very hot Wednesday to talk with us here. Uh, Kate, why don't you fill us in a little background on this this, my, this mileage tax pilot right. program? Well, Connecticut joined New Hampshire, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and Delaware to apply for a $2.1 <coughs> million dollars in federal money to study so-called mileage-based user fees, which would tax drivers based on the number of highway miles they drive. Uh, now, Senator, there was a lot uh, to say from Republicans last week on this, uh, but what's your take on it? Well, as far as I know about the grant, it was just a it was a grant to, for for volunteers to kind of look at the issue and determine whether or not this was from a regional perspective whether this was something uh, that should be considered um, probably regionally, maybe even nationally one day. Because there's as as most people know by just seeing what's happening in New Jersey, uh, highway trust funds are running out of money because uh, gas taxes are. Uh, not collecting the money that they need to. Highways are getting older, bridges are getting deficient. Um, so there needs to be a, a large investment and unfortunately the federal government is not providing uh, that kind of uh, leadership or or funding to really rebuild our, our highways, our bus bus systems and our rail systems. So I think it was just really a, uh, a voluntary, from what I read, a voluntary uh, system where people would look at it, maybe provide some results and, and determine whether or not it would be a good idea or not a good idea. But those of us in Connecticut, from a standpoint of whether or not we were going to uh, actually move forward with the idea outside this grant on a uh, involuntary process, uh, we were very, very clear about it last year that uh, I was anyway, and I know others were as well on the Democratic side that we were opposed to the idea. Um, I had put out a statement in August of set, August 7th of last year that uh, that said uh, that I was opposed to it in very strong terms. So I think there's uh, people making some hay out of thing, something that should be made hay out of. Wait, Tony Boucher is making hay out of something that shouldn't be hay shouldn't be made out of. <laughs> I've never heard of such a well, thing happening, Bob. <laughs> Um, well, I think there is some fear mongering going on by my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, because it is an election year and uh, they're trying to score some political points. But I mean, honestly, we put the issue to bed uh, last August uh, and, and, you know, because there was this, this federal grant and Connecticut participated in this grant that I think talked about this issue, maybe amongst many other issues as well, about dealing with transportation issues that the Republicans saw an opening here, decided to kind of go in and create fear amongst people, create panic when we were not doing it in the state of Connecticut. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little confused, and I understand you say this <clears throat> wouldn't happen, but how, how would it even work? How would you uh, monitor how much mileage someone uh, what drove on the highway? Would, is, it, is it through Easy Pass type uh, system? I have no idea, <laughs> and I think that's that's the issue here. Is that, and that's probably why the federal government's looking to to maybe institute something like this. Uh, not institute. I'm sorry, institute a study, uh, a voluntary study on this. I think Oregon was looking at it as well, and maybe one other country in Europe had been looking at it. I guess I really don't know, and I don't want to get into how it, how it might work. Um, but I think people are very concerned that it's a little Big Brotherish, <clears throat> for mm. one. Two is that it's also a little unfair. For instance, if somebody uh, has a electric car or they have a, a hybrid car that gets really good gas mileage, um, and they're trying to do the right thing. It, it's that isn't fair on a mileage tax uh, from a standpoint of somebody then owns a big gas guzzler. Right. Um, and so, you know, that that's a huge policy shift. So that's, I really, 
don't know how a mileage tax would work, which is one of the reasons why I came out last August uh, and opposed it as strongly as I did. That's what kind of amazed uh, me about this was that it's it's to go after electric car drivers uh, who, like you said, are are trying to do the right thing or at least find a different way to uh, to get around. And it's like, oh no, they're not paying taxes, so we got to figure out a way that we can tax them. And that would you'd think uh, discourage people to buy electric vehicles, right? Well, it could. Yeah, nobody really knows, um, and so that's part of the issue here. But you know. It's interesting how, you know, again, my friends on the other side of the aisle really don't want to kind of talk through an issue or uh, try to resolve some of the big transportation issues that we have here in uh, Connecticut, and especially in southwestern Connecticut. It's more of, well, there's an opening, so let's try to score political points rather than have a serious policy discussion on how to really solve issues. I mean, they, you know, Governor Malloy put forward a $100 billion transportation plan over 30 years. Uh, the Republicans, uh, had uh, come up with their own policy that would have would strip cities and towns of funding, would do would do very little to expand any kind of capacity, whether it's in rails or buses or in highways, and in fact they would just really maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, their opportunity to present a plan was nothing more than let's just keep what we have, and I think most people would agree that what we have is not adequate to what we need, uh, especially as we come back from the July Fourth holiday. And, you know, we all know the traffic over the last few months has been, mm -hmm. you know, really <clears throat> crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's been a lot of it. And uh, so that's why I think it's important to continue to have that transportation vision, figure out ways to pay for it, um, and let's not scare people in the meantime. So if you look through history, Bob, Connecticut's been expanding the size of its highways, uh, you know, since the automobile was a... Uh, was rolling around here and we had a speed limit of seven miles an hour um, and all that's done all that we've seen is, is is there's still more traffic and there's a there's a there's a theory out there among you know planners and engineers that if you build more roads it's just going to lead to more cars being on the road and not going to solve traffic do you think that the governor's 100 billion dollar transportation plan most of which was put on hold uh, this year is is the answer for for the future of Connecticut <coughs> Well, I think the $100 billion transportation plan is, is a, uh, certainly a good start. And, um, you know, it's, it's ambitious. It, you know, obviously it costs a lot of money. It does a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, highways and bridges that, that need uh, work after 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time for their replacement. They're functionally obsolete. Um, but we also have to keep in mind of our, our transit system, our buses and our trains, and having a truly integrated system. You know, there are plenty of people who would, especially in Southwest Connecticut, who would take the trains if there was uh, more frequent service and more reliable service right. um, and consistent service. So, for instance, and that's part of the plan is to almost make, and this is going to take some time, but to almost make Metro North like a subway type system where you have maybe shorter cars but more frequent cars mm -hmm. that takes people, you know, intrastate. Uh, we get an awful lot of people who go from, say, Norwalk to Greenwich or Norwalk to Stanford or Stanford to Norwalk or New York City to Stanford to Norwalk. So it's not like it used to be when the system was you know, first built where everybody went into New York. We get a lot of people who go intrastate. We get a lot of people who go from New York to Connecticut. Um, so it's really important for us that we focus on that. But also at the same time, we focus on that in a way that, uh, that also integrates the train stations and integrates a good bus system that encourages transit-oriented development, uh, that, you know, works on all these kinds of things at the same time and doesn't just do it in patchwork, but does it in a way that makes sense for the long term. I mean, you, you talk to any business, <clears throat> and one of their main issues um, is, 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 you know, the predictability, and especially in the fact that if they're trying to get to an airport, you know, in New York City or something like that, it is very difficult. And uh, we that is one of the issues that we have got to we've got to tackle and that 30 year transportation plan you know begins that process um, the the second issue really is how do we pay for it uh, we do have a piece of the sales tax uh, right now being used to divert it to to go to transportation along with the gas tax and the gross receipts tax um, you know but we've got to make sure that we can fund this into long term now, Senator, before we let you go, is there any other issues that you're kind of keeping an eye on this month that are happening around the state? Uh, there's always lots of issues that are that are out there right now. Um, you know, obviously our state budget and 
and uh, keep an eye on our our, uh, our fiscal challenges or fiscal issues, making sure that we still stay in balance. I mean, we cut uh, over you know a billion dollars this year in our state budget. We're back down to 2011 uh, numbers from our spending. We have about uh, 5,000 fewer employees, or we will uh, by the end of this fiscal year that just started than we did six years ago. Uh, we continue to make investments in housing and transportation and. Uh, education, higher education. So, you know, part of the part of the issue here, and the reason why I wanted to definitely talk to you, which I always enjoy doing, is that you know we've got to restructure our state government. We've got to focus, you know, continue to focus on the middle class and helping them grow, grow jobs organically, bring business in the state. <clears throat> but you, so you've got to restructure kind of the old way we've done things to to the new economy, but also at the same time still make key investments that. Uh, businesses are looking for so we can grow those jobs and bring the businesses into the state. We've had a number of successes of bringing businesses into Connecticut uh, this year over the last 12 months or so. Uh, we're going to continue doing that. You know, we all know about GE and them taking 200 jobs to Boston, but they're going to be putting five to 600 jobs in Norwalk from, from their Fairfield campus, so we're not losing all those jobs. We have brought a number of other jobs uh, from New York State into Connecticut. Um, our manufacturing is up last year for the first time in 20 years. Um, so those are all the kinds of things that we need to keep an eye on. It's, it's all got to be part of um, uh, one large kind of a vision, and not a short-term vision, but really a long-term vision that'll, that'll get Connecticut moving on its feet and invested into for the next generation. But it, it, there's a lot of public-private partnerships that are happening and that, that need to continue to happen as well. Well, you don't have a an easy job, uh, Bob, up there in Hartford. So I hope you're enjoying your your summer, your little time uh, down there in Norwalk, and making it to the beach every now and again. I try. <laughs> <laughs> I was I just fun. I, just, I, I got actually. To, I was just down at the beach a few minutes ago because we had a in Norwalk. We had a uh, they just put solar on the on the bathhouse there. It's the first one in the city, and uh, I was sitting there going, "How you know? How fortunate are we who live on the coast here to be able to have five minutes to get down to the water and." see the beautiful beaches that we have in the state of Connecticut. We have so much going for us in the state. And, you know, we hit bumpy bumpy paths and uh, bumpy roads from time to time, no pun intended. Um, but we, we will come back stronger and we'll, we'll continue to grow. Um, but, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. Unfortunately, uh, we never really get too much time off. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we've got to make sure we work hard each and every day for the people we serve. Right. Well, that's a good point to end on. I think that uh, no matter what political party you're from, we can all agree that we're very lucky to live in this beautiful state, uh, whether it be on the beach or, or uh, up in the, the woods. So uh, thank you, uh, yep. Bob Duff, uh, State Senate Majority Leader, for taking some time here in July. I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer, and um, I hope we get to talk to you again a lot as uh, election season rolls yes. around in November. Uh, anytime. Call me anytime. All right. All right thanks, thanks, Bob. Thanks so much. So when we come back, we were talking about, Kate, the uh, how they would track people to, to ch charge them for mileage. And uh, Jim Cameron says Big Brother's already watching you when you're in your car. And we're oh. going to get to that as soon as we get to these messages from our sponsors. You're watching CT Pulse on the HAN Network. Have a sports injury or a slip and fall that needs immediate care? Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care gives you direct access to an orthopedic specialist fast without an appointment. Biking, golf, tennis, soccer, whatever the sports injury is, sprain or fracture, Coastal Ortho Express can help. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care, open Monday through Saturday, now in two locations. The I Park Building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk and 36 Old Kings Highway South in Darien. Or go to CoastalOrthoExpress.com, like them on Facebook. Warm weather, light breezes, boats are in the water. There's no better place to celebrate summer than the Dock Shop. Whether in Darien at 51 Toconique Road or Westport at 609 Riverside Avenue, the Dock Shop is where you'll find everything you need to kick off summer. From the latest summer apparel to the newest fishing tackle, the Dock Shop will help you get the most out of your next beach day or harbor cruise. At the Dock Shop, you'll find a wonderful selection of items made in the USA and right here in New England, all with a distinct nautical flair. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the coastal lifestyle, this is a unique place to shop. DocShop.com. 
For more than 50 years, Triple S has been Fairfield County's expert service for carpet, upholstery, and drapery cleaning. We provide the best in repairs and in-depth restoration, understanding fabrics and how to properly clean and restore them. Our staff will come to your home to clean your wall-to-wall carpet to perfection. We can also pick up your fine carpets and bring them to our facilities. With locations in Norwalk, Stamford, and Stratford, Triple S will get the job done fast, big or small. At Triple S, you can count on our people as well as our cleaning. Find us at triplesclean.com or 203-847-8000. I'm John Kovach. I'm a newspaper editor. I'm a high school football coach. I'm a television presenter. And I want you to love fishing as much as I do. Tune into Yankee Fisherman Thursdays at 1 on the HAN Network. It's like going to the tackle shop without leaving your office. I'm John Kovach. You may feel that your car is your last private refuge in this busy world, but there's someone else along for the ride, Big Brother. I'm Jim Cameron for Talking Transportation, commentary and analysis on getting around in Connecticut. And you would be surprised what Big Brother knows about where you are, all thanks to modern technology. Take your cell phone, for example. You know, it is constantly transmitting its location, and generally available services like Google Dashboard would show you a location history of exactly where you were at any date in time. Don't want to be tracked? Turn off your cell phone. How about your Easy Pass? Even when you're nowhere near a toll booth, Easy Pass detectors can monitor your location. Want to stay anonymous? Keep your Easy Pass wrapped in aluminum foil in your glove box. Harder to avoid, though, are traffic cameras. That extensive network of highway cameras on our interstates and parkways used mostly to monitor for traffic accidents. But state police can also watch individual vehicles on those video displays, some of which are even available to the public online. But if there's any good news in this, state law specifically forbids those cameras from being used to write speeding tickets. One of the newest and most powerful tracking devices are license plate readers, as I saw riding along with my local police department a few years ago. These cameras mounted on police cars can scan up to 1,800 license plates a minute as cars drive by at speed. As the license plate is recognized, it's transmitted to a national crime computer and compared against a list of wanted vehicles and scoff laws. If the computer gets a hit, a dashboard screen in the cop car flashes a red signal and beeps, detailing the plate number and the infraction. In an hour of driving around in our town, we made stops for outstanding warrants, lack of insurance, and stolen license plates. Now, some towns also use license plate readers for parking enforcement at train station parking lots, foregoing the need for hang tags or stickers. While this may lead to very efficient law enforcement, license plate readers also have a potentially dark side. The data about plate numbers, location, and time can be stored forever. When there was a string of unsolved burglaries in Darien, the police used their license plate reader to track every car entering the targeted neighborhood and look for patterns of out-of-town cars driving through those neighborhoods at about the same time that burglaries took place, and guess what? They made an arrest. But the American Civil Liberties Union is concerned about how long police departments can store this data and how it might be used. However, they laud the Connecticut State Police policy of only storing data for 90 days. In the early days of license plate readers back in 2012, a staffer at the ACLU filed a Freedom of Information request for his car's plate number and found that it had been tracked four times by 10 police departments in the Hartford area alone. Even back in those early days, the database had 3 million scan records. So enjoy your car, but realize that none of us has any privacy. Jim Cameron for Talking Transportation. 
So, Kate, if you already weren't feeling uncomfortable yeah. enough on, on the road, so Jeez. how do you feel now? This is a transportation-heavy CT polls today. It really is. It, you know, and and uh, Senator Bob Duff did a good job of, uh, you know, segueing us uh, into that. I think so. All right. Well, Josh, we're going to talk now about some of the stories we're following today. A lot of what I saw last night, especially Connecticut Republicans sharing this, uh, and this story from CNBC that Connecticut's financially unstable Obamacare health insurance co-op was placed under state supervision on Tuesday, as regulators said 40,000 people covered by the company will ultimately have to find new plans for the coming year. Healthy CT is the 14th of 23 original Obamacare co-ops to fail since they began selling health plans on government-run Affordable Care Act insurance exchanges. Exchanges. Uh, several of the other remaining co-ops, at least, are believed to be on shaky financial ground. Yeah, it's. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine who uh, runs his own business and uses Healthy CT, and he's mm. rather worried. And, and they say the costs are going to go up for everybody in the state. You know, as much as a twenty-five percent. Wow. Uh, this year. Yeah. Or so next I think year, we're, we're going to be hearing a lot more on that. Uh, but I saw a lot of talk about that. Yesterday, good timing though for the end of end of Obama's term, right? He can get out just in time, and Donald Peace. Trump, Donald Trump can fix everything. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about some new laws that went into effect on July 1st. Josh, I know the Hartford Current did a nice story about 10 of those laws, uh, including the seven-day limit on initial opioid prescriptions, part of a larger piece of legislation aimed at tackling the growing opioid crisis and a spike in overdose deaths. Okay, yeah, that's. Uh, I think it's a big deal. We've uh, we've talked about this a number of times on this show and, and you on uh, Coffee Break, and we had all those great interviews with everyone from Silver Hill about that, and it seems to be the right move. It seems like, like a good if move. If you need more, you can always go back to the doctor. Right, right. Uh, and you know, Pfizer agreed recently to start putting... Um, they're going to start putting a warning label on on the prescriptions. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't see that. that you know, just I, yesterday I just out. saw an interesting billboard in Milford that said, would you prescribe your child heroin when they injure themselves? It was kind of a very shocking billboard yeah. that was up in Monroe. But I think this seems like the right move to me. It really does. And, and that that's a great way to put it. Uh, you know, Real Sports with Brian Gumbel and HBO last year did a, a really great piece on all these high school athletes who got injured, were prescribed opiates, and then it really ruined not only their athletic careers, but right. basically their lives. Right, and opiates could be beneficial for someone experiencing the kind of pain that those can handle, mm -hmm. but oftentimes they are prescribed in large quantities and people become addicted, right. so. What else is new? All right, well, arming community college police. Officers at the state's community colleges will be granted the same power as municipal police officers, including the ability to carry firearms under a bill that the legislature passed this year. Uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of very scary campus shootings. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, though, it is, I don't know. How do you feel about this one, Josh? I don't care. You don't care? No, if they want to, you know, if they're, as long as right. they're trained and as they long carry as they're guns, trained, you know, if that helps deter something, I, right. I feel better about, a, I guess, a, a security officer in a community college having a gun than a security officer in an elementary school having a gun. Yes. But that could just be, you know, how I'm looking at it. Right. So. All right, and uh, affirmative consent, something we've heard a lot about. Sexual assault policies at Connecticut colleges and universities will be required to use an affirmative consent standard when determining if sexual activity was consensual or not. Legislators defined affirmative consent as an active, clear, and voluntary agreement to engage in sexual activity. It's also referred to as yes means yes standard. That new standard uh, doesn't apply to criminal cases, but rather to the internal policies that guide mm. disciplinary proceedings at higher education institutions. Now, let's be real here. I mean, it's pretty hard to legislate uh, sexual assault in any right. kind of way, shape, or form. Though I think it's good that they're talking about mm -hmm. it, and I think it takes changing the mindset and raising awareness. Yeah. So in that way, I don't think it's a bad thing. Right, I certainly remember when I was growing up in the 90s, it was the big thing was no means no. Right. But that, you know, there's a lot of holes in that. And being positive is always better, Kate. You know, that's my yeah. philosophy in life is sure. to be positive. Mm. Um, so yes means yes, that also helps cut into the, you know, the if, if, if one of the partners is drunk and they don't say no, uh, but then right. you uh, conduct some something sexual with right. them. That was a really suave way of me the, saying that. Now there is there, a right? great video circulating online uh, that compares kind of sexual activity to having tea and if you're offering someone tea and all the ways that they can, it's very good. I suggest you, <laughs> you look it up. For example, this, if or? your friend was passed out, would you still try to give them tea? No, you wouldn't. So that's a good, a good idea and a good comparison, but it is actually a 
kind of a shocking video, but very informative. Yes, you I know, think. most college most college kids can relate to you know having having some tea. Having a cup of tea. Yes, yes, but yes. anyway, it's, it's a good, good learning. Good, point, good learning. Yeah. All right, uh, personnel records for educators. I thought this was interesting. Uh, to put an end to what supporters called passing the trash, new legislation requires school districts to increase the vetting process for new employees to prevent teachers who resigned after committing sexual abuse from getting a job in another school district. Hmm. Surprising it didn't already exist. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but that's good. So those are just some of There's us. too many laws, the laws that we that have that, that don't effect. matter at all. And now they're finally, <laughs> Connecticut's finally getting around to some laws that make sense. All right, Josh. Now, something else that we both uh, we talked about off air that was kind of interesting this week. Uh, Susan Chapman, who is the Republican first selectman of New Fairfield, put out a tweet that Connecticut Democrats called racist and offensive. Uh, I know we have a copy of that tweet to put up. We'll see what you think. Uh, but she said, public safety issue. Connecticut state needs to declare a moratorium on walk-ins at Squance Pond State Park in New Fairfield. Now, the photo she uses is uh, a lot of African-American families and people of color walking into the park. So some decried that as racist. And in fact, uh, Connecticut Democrats went after Mark Boughton, who retweeted that, uh, since Mark Boughton has uh, all but declared a gub as himself well, as a gubernatorial been, yeah, candidate. I mean, they, he, they declared for quite a while yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> for several <laughs> rounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's supposedly been a, you know, a gubernatorial candidate for like eight years yes. now, throughout the entire Obama presidency. Yeah. So, um, so I, you know, this is something where, to me, it, it's almost like it says almost as much about the person who perceives the racism as I think you disagree with me on this as, um, you know, so in, in the Democrats are looking, the Connecticut Democrats, of course, are looking for, for anything they can. And I think they sometimes in their blogs take it things a little bit too far, but they're a political party and that's what yep, they should that's their job. do. And there's plenty of Democrats. They got plenty of money to spend in this state, too. But is that... Um, unfortunate maybe that there are uh, people of color in that photo okay but also it's like can we not can we just take a photo of a group of people um and, right. and then Mark Bowden gets in trouble for retweeting it right I just see the safety issue and then showing a photo like that it, it made me kind of bristle like it, it rubbed me the wrong way yeah but you I know. could I certainly understand that the whole walk-in so that means they're not driving there they're right. being bussed up to Squants Pond right and, and New Fairfield is you know a predominantly white community it's a beautiful New yeah. Fairfield well Connecticut's gorgeous. a predominantly white you yes. know, state the, um, um so yeah I mean I could go either way I don't think you know the Democrats need to call her out on it but I did kind of you agree? I mean, you're, okay. you're uh, okay, yeah. I but mean. I don't know I don't know what she was thinking when she sent it none of us could know but I think some people need to be smarter about you know, social media use. No, How people need to be yourself. less smart about social media. We want well, we more stuff out We enjoy it on this show, actually. We, want, we like, show a lot of tweets, tweet, so we then really think. like tweet, it. Tweet, then think. <laughs> I think that should be the policy of all politicians in Connecticut. <laughs> uh, and just kind of ending on, on a nice story, but uh, it was just the one-year anniversary of a tragic murder of Trumbull resident Kevin Sutherland, who was aboard the Metro in Washington, D.C. on July 4th, 2015, when he was stabbed to death. But the nice part of this story is uh, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority is showcasing photographs that were captured by him. Uh, he was an American University graduate, and that artwork is now on display. Sutherland was mm. a talented photographer who enjoyed taking pictures of Washington, D.C. landmarks. Uh, he was traveling to capture Fourth of July fireworks when he became a victim of that horrific crime. So I do think it's a lovely way to honor him. And he was a former campaign aide for Congressman Jim Himes. And Jim Himes just today tweeted and asked people to honor Kevin's memory by donating to a memorial fund that was set up for him by American University. Those so. are beautiful photos. Gorgeous. He really was a talented photographer and he has a great family. Uh, his parents are lovely. They still live in Trumbull. But uh, Josh, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with Doug Smith. Some humor. Some humor to lighten things up a little bit on your CT Pulse. And with levity. Coming up after this. Walter Stewart's Market in New Canaan is your time-saving local shopping destination for the best of spring. Find many of your favorite products, from great specials on everyday items to the freshest organic produce, artisanal cheeses, and grass-fed steaks. Chop off your knives to be sharpened. Grab a beautiful bouquet of spring flowers and stop in next door for a wine tasting. Plus, their personal staff is always ready to lend a helping hand. So stop in to Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, today, or shop online at stewartsmarket.com. Mosquitoes, ticks, gone. Guaranteed. That's what Mosquito Squad guarantees as America's most trusted mosquito and tick control company. 
Locally owned and operated, over 90,000 homes have been protected by Mosquito Squad using their dual protection method for season-long protection, which includes barrier spray service for eliminating mosquitoes and adult ticks, as well as supplemental programs to increase tick control. They use only USDA organic options, which are safe and non-toxic. Contact them today at www.squadctny.com or 203-893-4309. Mosquito Squad. No bugs, no bites, no kidding. When it comes to local entertainment, we've got it all. From movies, local artists, etiquette, and more. Watch HAN Arts and Leisure every Thursday at 2 on the HAN Network. I'm Denise DiGregoli, the host of The Drive on the HAN Network. Join me Tuesdays for some motivational, intelligent talk with a little humor as we visit with people who live their lives mindfully. Tune in to The Drive live on Tuesdays, 1230, here on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski. Join us for Coffee Break weekdays at 11 to get the latest Connecticut news, weather, high school sports, and more. News doesn't get any more local than on Coffee Break on the HAN Network. You're watching the HAN Network, and you're not alone. Nearly one million people have watched our live sports, news, and entertainment programming since the network launched in August 2015. Advertise on the network that reaches Fairfield County, Connecticut's most engaged audience. Contact Advertising Director Jessica Murren at 203-273-7312 or email jessica at han.network. We are back on CT Pulse, and it looks like somebody put Doug Smith's superhero costume in the dryer. It seems to have shrunk a little no, bit. Doug. Uh, no, I, th I thought it fit. I, I <laughs> Looking good. Drawing conclusions with Doug Look Smith today. Look at how today. humble you are. You are Robin, not Batman. <laughs> well, that's, uh, <laughs> I know, most of us would make ourselves the lead character. It's like I, I made my cat there, Haley, who yeah. my wife says follows me everywhere and won't Aww. leave me alone, so <laughs> she should actually be Robin. But Catman. She's, She's more in charge, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doug, so let's take a look at what you've got for us this week. Up first, tell us about this one. Some, That's the uh, Music Under the Stars in Shelton on the Huntington Green. Uh, I couldn't <laughs> think of anything this week, so I just drew a star, like, <laughs> who actually is the face of my first boss I had as a teenager. He was ah, <laughs> crotchety old guy. <laughs> I used to draw sketches of him. And How many of those <laughs> do you have? You have, like, a lot of people from your, earlier oh, in your life hundreds. who end up making faces? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my great. gosh. I'm scared someday. All right, tell us about this one. <laughs> that was uh, the uh, DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, is uh, cut costs in uh, beaches and state parks all over. Right, right. And I don't even know how much lifeguards even make that they have to cut their hours. I know, you are know? they really saving that much Meanwhile, money? I mean, gotta, they say they are. They're saving something like $1.6 million guess, dollars yeah, or something. I guess, but then you got a glut of guys up in Hartford just sitting around doing nothing, so that was my <laughs> message here. Like, let's lay them off and keep the lifeguards. <laughs> All right, and uh, uh, so we have some Trumbull, some health department right. drama here. Tell us about this. Yeah, one. well, that was a year ago. The Trumbull Health Department used to be uh, Trumbull part Monroe of, uh, Health District. Yeah, right, Monroe when they broke off, and Monroe wasn't happy about that, as no, I recall. So they were not. They just had their year anniversary, and they're doing really well, apparently. So we have Monroe in the background, kind of. Hmm. How's Monroe doing? Are they over well, yet? That, or they well, that's on the twenty pounds. <laughs> 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 They're working on their revenge pod right now. They're like, I promise I'm going to stop drinking soon. <laughs> 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 All right. Up next, we have some more uh, Batman humor. Nice. Yep. <laughs> so the Stratford Cat Project holding a ladies' night July 14th. Right. Uh, I think you're looking for the Stratford Bat Project. That's your dad <laughs> humor that we love that so is. much. <laughs> <laughs> And I love this one, too. Easton kindergarten sizes will be bigger this fall. <laughs> it's the growth hormone in those kids. You know? yeah. I think they meant class sizes, but I yep. like this. <laughs> and tell us about this one, Doug. That's, um, is that uh, Reading? I believe. Route 7 yeah, will be closed. Yeah, Route 7 will be closed for several Saturdays right. this summer. No, actually, that's uh, that was Redding's cartoon a couple weeks ago, and I mm. just modified it to work for Ridgefield. Oh, nice. Those so. drones are being used everywhere. <laughs> just need a few of them to get you going. All right. Tell so us about this one. I, this was a silly one. Uh, they got the movies in uh, Wavenly Park, and so we just have the little UFO there saying, oh, this one, it turns out, where, shut up. So he ruins the movie for right. everyone. We don't want an advanced race sharing their knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it happened again. What is it with you guys in this underpass? That's, that's I know Darian. what you're talking it's about. It's like it, every year, 
maybe twice a year yes. or some clown goes under the underpass right down there on the post road and gets stuck under the bridge. Every time. I, it's like if you're driving that big of a vehicle, don't you just... Well, maybe when the truckers are saying 10-4, they're thinking that's the height of the bridge or so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids enjoyed Ooh, a totem like pole it. class at Latchet Farm. Oh, yep. <laughs> led to some criminal mischief there. Yep. <laughs> He's being it. creative. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that does it, Doug. As always, okay. thanks so much for joining us. Okay, thank so you. I'm glad to see you came back safely from your July 4th. Yes, I'm for all those fireworks. Oh yeah, you had a, <laughs> yeah, I know. Last he seemed like yeah. he was really into it. The first thing <laughs> I did on Tuesday was check yeah. count Doug's fingers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Doug. Thanks so thanks. much. Josh, we're going to wrap things up on this week's show, CT Kate. Pulse. It's it has been a great be show. You. Of course, if you missed anything, you could watch it on demand later at han.network. And we will see you next week for CT Pulse. That's Wednesdays at 1230. Have a great day.